Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it's time for the Q&A, so let's go ahead and get this started. Alright, first question. If you don't have access to barbells and plates because of lockdowns, are dumbbells still effective? Uh, good question, and I, I, a lot of people are still dealing with this around the world, unfortunately. So, uh, I made quite a few videos on different workouts that people do with bands and dumbbells and things, and what I'm going to say, are they, they still effective? Sure, they're effective. Are you going to be able to get the same results? Of course not. You know, if you squat 500 pounds, you're not going to maintain your 500-pound squat and even your entire lower body and core development uh, with a few dumbbells at home. It's just not going to happen. You can maintain a lot of your muscle mass and maybe even gain some in certain areas. Now, I'm going to assume that anyone who has been following my channel for any length of time already has multiple sets of bands at home. Because if you don't, then you clearly haven't been paying attention. I tell everyone bands are amazingly useful. You need to have them. I make all of my clients buy bands. Even if they train at a gym, they buy bands, have them at home. You can incorporate this with your stuff. Bands will also let you add extra resistance to some of your dumbbell movements if you have limited weight. But you're going to end up doing a lot of isolateral stuff. Uh, what do I mean? Well, a lot of step-ups. A lot of step-ups onto boxes or benches or, or whatever you have to step up on because you're not going to be able to get enough weight to train your quads and glutes and things otherwise. You're not going to be able to do two leg movements and get very much work in, even if you have a pair of 50 or 60 pound dumbbells and you clean them up to your shoulders, I mean, you'd be doing 200 rep squats. So you're going to have to do some, some single leg movement. Same thing, single leg Romanian deadlifts. You're going to have to do these things. The downside, of course, is that your trunk doesn't get involved enough. In other words, your torso and your core will stay weak if you only do single leg movements. And that's something people don't factor in. Though there are certain people, oh, I think athletes should be doing these. Well, you're not loading up their, their torso. Hey, you're not getting the strength and development that you need. There's more to big movements like that than just your quads. So you're probably going to need to do dumbbell good mornings also. Clean them up to your shoulders and do very high reps with good mornings would be really useful. Uh, you know, again, so th those are things you're going to need to do. You can do a lot of upper body stuff. Again, floor presses, overhead pressing, rowing, all that stuff can be done. You can do arm work. And, and then you need to learn to incorporate bands and stuff with it as well. And you're going to end up doing a lot more higher conditioning work. But you know what? That's not a bad thing. How do I train these days? What do you guys see me mostly doing? Maxes and 20 rep sets. And I do 20 rep squats and everything else, right? The volume work is fine. And, and if anything, you know, you can do a ton of volume with all the stuff that you have. Do a lot of volume. You can get your conditioning up a little bit. And then when gyms do reopen, you can regain your strength. You can regain your strength then, hopefully. All right, next question. How would you run conjugate for a pro BJJ athlete, someone who trains BJJ hard five to seven days per week? Should the... the Session volume and accessories be lower as well and moving over to three days a week. Uh, actually, we've had some back and forth uh, in my comments and stuff. Me and this lifter, and he does this, and he actually does a three-day per week conjugate. And that's actually what I have my contact sport athletes do because at, at this point, that's my largest demographic. My two biggest demographics uh, is, again, contrary to what people think I'm claiming. I guess a bunch of people think that I'm a powerlifting coach and I'm actually not. I do not coach specifically powerlifting. I have some powerlifters who I coach and only one of them has elite numbers. Only one of them. But I have a lot more contact sport athletes and combat athletes, which means things like BJJ, MMA, boxing, wrestling, and active duty military if you have a combat role. Those all count as combat athletes. And their training is relatively similar on the conjugate. Right? They, those people all actually have the similar needs. And unless they have the recovery to handle for a day, and I have some who do, actually have some who do, their conditioning is just that amazing, we do the three-day. And so what we do with the, the three-day, I would say, yeah, you do need to limit volume a little bit. You do need to limit volume. You need to look at your total volume from it and ask, am I getting what I need? Also, you, you have to look at those guys and ask yourself, is are they getting beat up? In other words, someone who's in that situation, who's doing all of that BJJ 
and they can't afford joint soreness and stuff going into it, we don't do low rep supplemental work. Okay, we don't do that. I have them do, if possible, bands and chains only for maxing, unless we want to test a classic lift. We do bands, 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 bands for speed work. Their supplemental work, we don't do heavy stuff because we can't afford them to get beat up. We can't come in and do five rep box squats. Okay, we, we can't come in and do five rep floor press. We can't do all of that. We need to get in and just hit the movements that they need for someone in, who's doing this much training for, for, a, for a sport like this. We can't come in and beat them up with all of that. We can't do a bunch of really low rep stuff and we can't have excessive volume either. You need to just identify all their weak links and what's gonna give them the sport specific carryover, keep them in the 10 to 20 rep range and with only a key number of supplemental lifts. Now, if you can have them on something like a reverse hyper, that would be really good, but it's gonna to tend to be minimalist in nature. You're gonna push them really hard on things like rowing going to push them really hard on good mornings right we're probably not going to do much supplemental squatting you can't have their their quads getting sore with all this other stuff that's not going to be a, a, a lot of that and then you start looking at what they need that's going to be sport specific so if they do a lot of grappling like bjj we i have them do a lot of fat bar work so if they have access to a fat bar a lot of their supplemental work would be done with a, with a fat bar a lot of their rowing, a lot of their floor pressing for higher reps. Okay. Any supplemental pulling we do, we're going to tend to do things like that. Because they need that, that extra grip. They need that grappling ability. And having to work with the fat bar will do that. So I would say bands, chains, fat bars are really, really important for these people. Particularly the bands and a fat bar. And then any other specialty bars you can get. And their volume is going to have to be minimized. Because if they're doing BJJ five to seven days a week, uh, we're not trying to build work capacity in the gym anymore. We're trying to just get them bigger and stronger and faster without beating them up. All right, next question. Hey coach, will you eventually return to a normal conjugate training system using dynamic effort method and only maxing two times a week? Good question. Uh, all of, almost all of my clients, with a few exceptions, train that way. I do not see myself returning to that. I'm not going to say never. I'm not going to say never because I very well might. I do not currently have plans to do so. And a lot of it comes down to I'm already fast. My lifestyle is geared towards recovery. So one of the big benefits, one of the big benefits that we get from speed work is that it's easier to recover from than the max work. And it gets more work done. You get a lot of practice on your stuff and it helps build work capacity and conditioning, but it's easy to recover from. Right, because it's very hard to come in and do more than two max effort days a week. It can beat you up if you're not careful. I have my recovery pretty well perfected, and then I get all my conditioning and practice and stuff from all the really high rep work. So I find that for me, this system that I'm using seems to work very, very effectively. It seems to work very effectively. Although, if anything, I got the most out of, out of speed work on my benching, you know, which is always my weakest lift. But I don't think that I need to return to the speed work to get my bench up. I just need to build muscle and tendons in the right places. But I actually really enjoy doing the four-day max effort. I enjoy lifting heavy that often. Uh, it's a, it can be harder on recovery. But I'm not worried about the loss of conditioning because I do so much high rep work and high rep lower body work as my supplemental lifts that I'm also not worried about the, the conditioning benefits that we get from the speed work. Now, if I were to change over to, say, competing in some sport that required me to be more explosive, I would absolutely throw the speed work back in. But right now, just for, for hitting elite numbers, I don't think it's necessary for me to do it because of the way that I have my system and lifestyle organized right now that I can just run double ill me. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.